Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 1st, 2016, and this is the week in charts. So, what are we talk about? Well, of course, as usual, current market conditions. Also, your questions that you may have on trading, and of course, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, uh, wait until we get to the actual charts for stock picks. And the other thing I would ask you to do is just type them in one at a time. Hey, Larry, uh, thanks. Uh, Larry Pesavendo is here today. Hey, Larry, I'm um, impressed that you're here. Thank you so much. I'm flattered. He says, Teresa from Hong Kong says hi. Well, tell us, say hello, too. Yeah, ter I love Teresa. She's awesome. Thank you, Larry. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is that we're nearly in this constant state of fear and frustration, and that's actually been quantified, which I find really fascinating. And, and for me, it was a bit of an epiphany. And uh, the longer you're at this, you, you would think that, or you would think someone that's been at this for a long time would have it all figured out and would be calm and relaxed. And, and I give that appearance, I think, nightly in a trading service and often in my columns and sometimes even in these webinars, but the reality is, I, you know, just because you have a pulse, I mean, I'm sorry, just because you decided to trade doesn't mean you no longer have a pulse. So I'm still a human being. And a lot of that will come out um, as we go through this. Real quick, there's a disclaimer screen. As often summing up all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I stole that from Greg Morris. Occasionally, I'll ask my wife what she thinks about my column. And I find I do that less and less. And that's usually because she often says, well, Dave, you say a lot of the same shit. And that's a direct quote. I don't know if she'll appreciate me quoting her, but she shouldn't mind. She could be very matter of fact at time. And my reply to that is, I'm going to keep saying the same shit until you people get it. Now, it sounds like I'll be a little crass, a little tough here. But it looks like I might be here for a while. Don't laugh at me, but I've been thinking about KO. Since it is a bullish move when there is a KO move like there is a gold, and now because all the skittish investors have gone, there's nowhere to go but up. So he's thinking about buying Coke. Now, this is someone who should know better. This is someone who's been trading for quite a long time. And I really thought he was busting my chops when he asked me. And I actually had to ask him that, was he? And, and I'm like, seriously? It looks like an electric cardiogram, which I'll show you in one second. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's down, it's up, and now it's down. So, in spite of all my preachings and teachings, <laughs> I get asked about a stock that looks like this. An electric cardiogram. In fact, you can almost overlay the electric cardiogram over the chart. It looks a lot the same. One of the as I often say, one of the most rewarding things for me is, and, and uh, musicians say that when the it's very rewarding when they're up singing and, and the audience sings their songs back. I wouldn't know that because I'm not a very good singer, as some of you can attest when I uh, sometimes when I sing at the beginning of these things. Anyway, uh, I, I kind of get a feel for what that must be like because sometimes when I'm speaking to a, a foreign-speaking audience through a translator, and I'll say, if the stock looks like, or the chart, whatever we're looking at, looks like an electric cardiogram, then it's probably something that you won't, that you don't want to be trading. And if you could hear that beep, 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 beep in your head, and it's kind of fun because even though they're not English speaking or most aren't English speaking, I'll start showing charts that look like the aforementioned Coke, and then they'll start beeping, and I can hear the audience beep. And it's just really kind of a fun thing, and it's kind of exciting for me. Now, this is the actual back of my business cord. I actually have some things in the works with my arrows that might be a little fun. And 
the bottom line is you really need to ask yourself, is it in an uptrend, is it in a downtrend, or is it just going sideways? And that's no trend. And by the way, it's called trend following. Since the only way to profit from a market move is to catch a trend, we will seek trends and follow them. So it's very important. And you should never forget that to follow a trend, you must first have a trend to follow. I'm going to suggest that you write that down. In fact, in spite of all my teachings and preachings, I still get charts that look like that. Now, I beat you guys up pretty bad in here, and my apologies for that sometimes. But if you knew, if you knew to trading and you knew to, or and or new to the methodology, then ask away. Uh, don't worry about the stocks you're asking. But as I've been working hard to train you guys and girls over the past several years, you shouldn't be asking about stocks that look like KO. And you shouldn't be bringing those stocks up in the webinar. You can bring up anything you want, but just if it looks like a ledger cardiogram, I'm going to use it as a teachable moment. Now, what's interesting is we live in this state of trying to make something happen. And that's, and I don't want to digress too far, but that goes back to the we're not made to trade thing that I'm often talking about. Because in the real world, what do you do? If you're a doctor, you're going to have to see some patients. If you're an engineer, you're going to have to build some bridges or design something or do something. You have to do something. But a lot of times in trading, there's nothing to do. But we feel that urge because it's human nature. And by the way, the more successful you are in life, the harder it is to become successful in trader, trading. And that the one, the, the Coke chart mentioned earlier that this gentleman's a doctor, successful doctor, successful businessman. Okay. And he works, I would guess he works very long hours because I don't think the success just comes out of nowhere. It doesn't fall from the sky. But he's probably feeling that motivated, that motivation to try to make something happen in the markets. So do not try to trade. Do not try to try a trade. I need to fix that. <laughs> do not try to make a trade where a trend doesn't exist. And Peter Moffey once said, don't invent trades. And that story comes from, I know I've told it ad nauseum. But I'm going to keep telling it to you people get it, right? Um, I was on a project with a bunch of other traders, kind of a who's who of, of the trading world. Larry McMillan was one of the guys on there. I mean, I'm not name dropping. I'm just saying there's like a lot of big names. And I was very humbled by this, and I was a little nervous to be on this team. And Peter was running the team, and I'm like, uh, Peter, I might not be the guy for this this project. They might, I might go uh, days or weeks without a trade. Because the way trend trading works, sometimes it just doesn't set up every day or even every week. So I'm not going to have a whole lot of input. And by the way, the way we got paid was to recommend trades. We weren't paid to be on the panel or the team. We were paid by the amount of product we produce. And he goes, Dave, you're exactly the guy we want. Don't invent trades. And by the way, Now's probably not the best time to invent a trade. Take a look at the S&P 500, and what do you have? Well, the past couple of months, you've got a sideways range. Now, this has been a pretty good summer and a pretty active summer, more active than I remember uh, in, in more recent times. But it's like the summertime finally caught up. And you can see that we really haven't made a whole lot of change on a net net basis. My inbox is full of emails from forums and, and newsletters from people talking about all these anomalies in the S&P 500. I don't know if you call them anomaly because it happens every now and then. But 
the fact that the market really hasn't moved much in a while. And by the way, if you ever forget or lose your way in the market, just remember where is the price today and then look back at time and see where the price was. And if there's not much change over the past days, weeks, months, and beyond, maybe it's not a trend. Maybe that trend is sideways. Now, we live in this almost constant state of fear of losing. Hi, Dave. Such sucks watching our position slowly drift lower except PI, pi. When all positions drift lower, it makes me want to take position off of pi for fear. It will also go lower. Am I the only one? Lance. So last week we talked about trading as easy as pi, and we used the pi example. And then this week we have yet another example with pi. Now, fortunately, it worked out. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit in a second. And I thought about it going into today's presentation. What if it doesn't work? It's like, well, that's a lesson, too. Sometimes it doesn't work. We'll get into that in a minute. But last week we talked about entering pi at 20 with an initial profit target of 23 and a stop three points away, an initial profit target of three points. And what happened? Well, it hit the profit target for swing trade and scratched out on the remainder. So this is what I call the better than a poke in the eye trade. And as I say every week, I'm sick of myself saying it. But if you're not happy with making 1% overall on your overall trading account, in this case, 100 k $1,000, if that bothers you, letting that erode into a scratch, then send me the money, keep enough out for massage so you can go get yourself centered and forget about the trade. And I haven't seen or haven't received the check in 20-something years of doing this. Now, so what do we have a couple days ago? Once again, pi set up again. So we had a buy in the pie at 22. We had a stop just in case we're wrong. And then we had an initial profit target of 25 for a risk of three points once again. So let's look at what happened. So we had the original trade back here. This was the initial profit target. And you can see it came down and scratched out. Okay, for better to poke in the eye trade. Now, the new trade was to come back in here with a stop here and initial profit target right here. Now, fortunately, it gapped above that. So you make a little bit more than what you intended to make. You were looking to make 1K per 100K on a trade. And this one's not highlighted, so that's the um, that means that it came out. Half of that trade, half of those shares came off today. So you get this piece out of here, and then this is just based on the mark to market where it was when I was putting the slide together a few minutes ago. So let's just say, based on that that number, based on taking the profits in that number. That's a $3,000 swing per 100K. So that's a 3% swing that could have easily bid, that you could have easily micromanaged yourself out of because the rest of the stocks in the portfolio have drifted lower and you feel like the sink is shipping. You better just at least grab something. So, we exist in this constant state of fear of losing. And unfortunately, what you have to realize is playing not to lose is not a winning strategy. I was getting a cup of water a minute ago, and I got to thinking about that. The And it comes down to, and I'm not going to let freshman psychology rear its ugly head, but from my own personal experience and from reading some of these behavioral finance books, it sort of confirms it that the fear of losing has a bigger emotion attached to it 
than the motivation for winning. And I guess it's just in our innate being in that, that, that if you really want to boil it down or really get a little deeper, it probably, it's probably rooted in our survival instinct. Our survival instinct is probably a lot more stronger or is a lot more stronger than our motivation, motivational motivation instinct. So applied to trading is we have this constant fear of losing and this constant, we're constantly encouraged to enact some sort of damage control constantly. I'm not talking damage control on a trade where you have to take action and use a little discretion. I'm just talking like a constant state of damage control where you're constantly trying not to lose. But playing not to lose is not a winning strategy. And I'm not a big football fan. Occasionally I'll go to a Saints game, but that's about it. And so I don't want to show my ignorance about what little I know, but I do know that a few years back, long before they ever won the Super Bowl, the Saints got into this, what was called the, uh, was it the prevent offense or the prevent? I forget how it goes. But what you do is once you're ahead by so much, you go into this prevent mode and you just try not to lose the game. Well, that failed miserably, at least for the Saints. And, and to me, that's like a playing not to win strategy, but more of a playing not to lose strategy. And then the other team plays the win and kills you. <laughs> and micromanagement is playing not to lose. Like Lance was saying, geez, I don't want to let what little profit I have left in my portfolio erode. Well, hopefully he didn't. I sent him a little letter yesterday and saying a lot of things what I'm saying today. And hopefully he didn't cash out because of that fear motivating him to do that. Micromanagement, as I I did, I do remember sending uh, in a letter to Lance, and as I've talked about in weeks prior. I did quite a few presentations on micromanagement lately. Micromanagement will often, and maybe I should even say more than often, more than often pay off shorter term, but never longer term. So this one trade example, and luckily it worked out. I hate to use the word luck, but luckily it worked out twice in a row. But twice in a row, I had two different clients who both wanted to exit these trades early. And again, micromanagement will often pay off shorter term, but never longer term, because you might mitigate some damages, damages shorter term, but if you micromanage yourself out of a winner, you'll never have a winner. And more often than not, you will micromanage yourself out of a winner. So you might also want to write that down. Now, as I said a few weeks back when I was doing the micromanagement presentation, there's always a reason to exit a trade, and rarely a reason to stay, like Lance pointed out, and rightfully so. Hey, Dave, portfolio's uh, not looking so hot as of late. Looks like we're kind of uh, eroding in here. Looks like the ship's beginning to sink. I better grab the last of what's left before that erodes too. And it's a valid point. It's a logical point. It's very logical. But that's not the way you trade, and that's not the way you succeed. You don't succeed by playing not to win. There's rarely a reason to stay. You could always find a reason to, to, to bail out. And rarely a reason to stay. Now, interesting development over the past few days. 
does it nearly always suck when you're trading? And this was a little bit of an epiphany for me. Well, there's a better than average chance that right now you're not feeling too good about your trades. And there's actually a reason for that. Robert Frey says you spend 75% of the time in a state of regret. In other words, drawn out. One of my clients sent me this uh, video last week, and I finally got a around to watching it yesterday, or day before, anyway. And he had some really interesting statistics and analysis. But if you boil it all down, the crux of what he was saying is that you're almost always, or at least 75% of the time, giving up some open gains or in some sort of drawdown. So you spend a lot of your time, and he also mentioned Pareto Principle. Seems like Pareto Principle rears its ugly head in everything you do in life. Pareto Principle is the 80-20% rule. 20% of your clients give you 80% of your business. 20% of your trades give you 80% of your profits. 20% of your children give you 80% of your problems. 20% <laughs> of your employees give you 80% of your problems. It, 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 just, it just shows up everywhere. It's like it's, it's this, this universal statistic. Well, it's also showing up in this realm of trading. So Mr. Frey's point is that we're in this constant state of regret. And think about that and embrace your feelings. And it's like you're always, you know, once you've done this for a while, I mean, if you just get started and you, get, you, hit a, you hit a lucky streak, you just feel like, God, that's, that's a total different complex. But once you've done this for a while and, been, and have been humbled over and over and over again, you're going to find out that more often than not, you don't really feel good about your trades. And now we know why. Because 75% of the time, they're not going to be working. So I thought this was pretty interesting, and I'm glad that um, Dr. J sent me to That's uh, my client that sent this to me. So thanks, Dr. J, for sending this to me. So I, I find this really useful, and you'll probably hear about that again. Same shit, different day. Yeah, mentality is key. And we define mentality, or I define, uh, I found a definition I like of mentality, I should say, as a habitual characteristic mental attitude that determines how you interpret and respond to situations. And as I often say, I think attitude when it comes to trading is much more important than aptitude. And I would rather someone who has the right attitude any day over someone who's really smart. And it's kind of interesting. Mr. Frey is a brainiac, but he kind of embraces that mentality, obviously, and, and he's ran billions of dollars over the years. One thing that I've talked about recently, and I keep this just this kind of a reoccurring thing that keeps coming to my head, into my head, is that winners come along just enough and no more to keep you from quitting. It seems like, in like today's example with the pie, it's kind of like I knew we were at a bit of a drawdown. I wasn't really worried about it too much, but then I get reminded by clients. It's like, yeah, it was kind of gnawing away at me in the back of my head. And then what happens? You get that one good trade. And throws you back up. It makes you, hate to say, feel good. But all of a sudden you feel good about what you're doing and you realize you're doing the right thing. And that's the hard part of it is, and this is where Peter Moffey criticized me. Uh, and I've told this story a thousand times too. I need some new stories. But I'm, I'm going to get out soon. I'll get some new stories. I promise. <laughs> but I gave a speech in Dallas a few years back. And then after the speech... I was staying at his house, went over, and um, we kind of went through 
some notes on 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 things and and uh one thing he said was he goes you said it's streaky he goes that makes it sound a little too elusive well it is elusive and i haven't solved for that and the day i saw for that's a day you'll never see my fat ass again uh but it is a little streaky it seems like those winners come along just at the right time and and just enough i guess any more probably go to your head and you really have to chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it. And what Mr. Frey says makes a lot of sense. It's like, you know, while you're chipping away at it, three quarters of the time, you're going to be stressed out because things aren't going your way. A couple of random thoughts on all this. It nearly always sucks, okay? And there's no better way of putting that. Maybe I'll become a little bit more eloquent eloquent in time and, and polish this presentation up a little bit. But the reality is it nearly always sucks. And for me, that's an epiphany. I can wrap my head around that now and say, okay, it's normal to be stressed out. It's normal to to be bummed out because something's going against me and more often than not it will go against me and if you think about it on a micro level like on a very very micro level if you're watching those ticks intraday like right before the presentation i was looking at the pie pi and it's like oh it gapped open and oh that's good so i felt good and oh it looks like it's keep it's going to keep on going so i felt good and then what happens well then it begins to reverse a little bit. So it's like, all of a sudden, it's like, well, wait a minute, that, that eroding profit is a negative feeling, even though it's a positive thing overall, okay? So just embrace the fact that it's nearly always going to suck, and I think the more you stare at the screen when you're not supposed to or you don't have to, okay? the more stressed out you're going to be. Just let it unfold. Let it go. Let it go. There's it singing again. So it's nearly always going to suck, so you have to get over it. And then your big winners come along just about the right time. And, again, you're never going to win by playing not to lose. So play to win. I had a – uh, a little trade I took a couple days ago for S&Gs and um, the pound yen. I can never remember uh, trades that often on the uh, like something to Forex because I, I try to just be antiseptic about it. But it was just a little thing, and I just uh, saw a little setup, and I took it. And then overnight, it began working out pretty nicely for me. And I did have a plan in place. I did have a stop in place and a trailing stop. And I got to think, it's like, I need to loosen that up a little bit because this could be a much bigger move. And it's like, well, let me just leave it where it is from now, that, that stop trailing it fairly tightly. And it crossed my mind. I actually said, Dave, are you playing not to lose? Because I had a nice little quick profit overnight because I've been going through a drawdown in the Forex trades. And this trade at a small profit is going to help me climb out that, that drawdown. But I actually said it, am I playing not to lose or am I playing to win? And I think letting it open up, obviously, well, in perfect hindsight, would have been the thing to do. And while I did that mental masturbation, for lack of a better word, it, it, did, it stopped out on me. So, you know, guilty as charged for making some of these mistakes and and, and letting, letting these things affect me. But it really made me think, am I playing not to lose in this trade? And I've been doing the, uh, the service long enough to where I'm forced to follow the plan a lot, a lot more because I'm, so to speak, being – my shoulders being looked over because I'm actually recommending the plan to trade, the exact plan to trade. And 
there's less inclination, obviously, to wing it because there's an actual plan in place. And I can't tell you to wing it because that's just going to create a lot of stress out there as opposed to just giving you an exact plan. And now I have a plan in place. I'm forced to make that plan. So that's from a selfish standpoint, that's kind of kind of a cool thing for me. I'm not only getting getting paid to follow my plan, but I'm getting paid to make a plan. Now, here's the thing you have to realize. Following the process doesn't always mean success, but that's where success comes from. And it's hard to follow the process, especially when you hit a string of losers, okay? But it's, it's hard to do that. And that's why in the open portfolio, even when it goes negative, I always say, well, let's just follow the plan. And if we get stopped out, we get stopped out. Okay. And often things will go against you. According to Mr. Frey, 75% of the time things will go against you. So what I would recommend you do, especially if there's nothing to do, is make something happen in your life. And don't try to make something happen in the markets. Don't trade a stock that looks like a ledger cardiogram. Go out and maybe, if you're a cardiologist, <laughs> go out and look at electric cardiograms, okay? Take care of your patients. Take care of your business. Spend some time with your loved ones. Do spend time studying the markets. And sometimes it's a little hard for me in the middle of summer when things are choppy, going sideways, to chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it. But from a selfish standpoint, again, being forced to do that every day, even if there's nothing to do, no action to be taken, but being forced to do that every day allows me to find stocks like Pi. They don't come along every day, okay? Again, you know, here's Peter. I can hear Peter's voice in my head. I can almost hear his voice saying it. You know, you can't keep saying it's streaky. You can't see, keep saying it's, it's elusive, but it is. You just have to chip away at it. And sometimes in the summer, you don't feel like doing your homework, but you have to do your homework. So make your action, your research – and not your action, your actual trades. And as I often say, my probably my all-time favorite quote, I probably need to uh, write it down and put it on a wall in my office. I'm put it, maybe put it in the corner of my office as a uh, kind of a metaphor. Jimmy Rogers once said, in, in the first market wizards, he waits until there's money lying in the corner. And all he has to do is walk over and pick it up. In the meantime, I do nothing. And that's just a wonderful thing to think about. Coca-Cola bouncing back and forth and trading all over the place is not money lying in the corner. Okay. But an IPO that makes a nice little uptrend and makes a nice little pullback, it sets up within the parameters of the system. There's no guarantee there, but your chances are a lot better going with something like that, something that's hot and exciting and above all, and more importantly, set up. You're much better off going with something like that than you are something that's just bouncing around because you're looking for something to do. By the way, I had, um, I needed to, I felt like I had to put something in the uh, newsletter for, uh, because it was Labor Day weekend or the, or tomorrow's newsletter I should say. And then today's uh, post for the uh, service. Of the, what? Let me rewind that. I felt like uh, I had a banner ad in my template for my email to go out for this um, week of charts. So I decided to put the uh, IPO course on sale. So that's in that, uh, that was in that email. And then there's no promo code need or anything. So you can just go straight to the, the page on that. Okay. So even more SSDD. To wrap all this up, there's really only two things you have to do. Pick the best and leave the rest. And we're going to open it up for stocks in just a few minutes. And we're going to look at how to do just that.
but that's really well we probably won't find much because the market's choppy so I guess that was an unnecessary tease but the bottom line is wait until that money's lying in the corner in the meantime don't do anything and then it's cliche but you have to plan your trade and trade your plan all right a couple of announcements um still working on the beginners course I'm getting close or getting closer I should say to being done and it's not only a beginner's course, but it's a come back to the beginner's course. And just like I said earlier, I'm going to keep saying the same stuff until you people get it. And even though people have been trading for a while, it seems like a lot of times they're still making the same mistakes, trading in mediocre stocks, micromanaging, and a plethora of other bad behaviors. So a lot of that beginner's course you've been seeing in these presentations that I do each week. So I think it's going to be pretty good. And then I'll have a multi-part base coming out. As I said quite a bit, and as I'm going to say when I do the actual videos on this thing, it, it's a lot more, and this is what I wrote last week, last Friday, if you want to read it on my website. Initially it became, okay, let me just show the setups and show the money management and mention trading psychology and, and, and you know, bam, 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 got a course, okay, beginner's course. And then early into the process, first few slides of the process, I began thinking, what's more importantly, and what's more important than, than the actual mechanics? The mechanics are fairly simple. And, and trading is not easy, but the mechanics are pretty darn simple once you get a little bit of experience and you bet under your belt. It's the execution of the mechanics. It's trying to make something happen when nothing exists. It's the micromanagement and all these other mistakes that are made. So the course quickly became what someone who's much more seasoned may have lost sight of over the years, especially if they're in a drawdown. And by the way, there's a three quarters of a percent chance, I guess, that you would be in a drawdown based on what I learned a couple days ago. So what someone much more seasoned may have lost sight of. Now, I expect someone who's been around for a long time and has a lot of experience to go back and watch that course. But that's exactly what they should do. And it's kind of like the other way I approached it is if I could go back in time and talk to that young punk version of me, what would I tell him? And obviously I couldn't tell him where the Dow would be trading or the S&P or Russell, whatever. But if, if I could only tell him a little trading advice, it would be that your mentality is key. Don't spend so much time chasing that holy grail. Chase it a little bit, okay, because that's where you're going to get, you're going to unearth some things in that process. But realize there is no holy grail and spend as much time working on yourself as you do working on figuring out the market. Um, by the way, make sure at the least that you're on the delayed service so you can see these things unfold without perfect hindsight. That's a great way to learn. Uh, about the markets is to and the methodology is to see it warts and all even with a little delay and that's going to help you out tremendously so you'll see the actual pie set up you'll see it a little bit later but that's fine and you'll see the pie hit the initial profit target then you'll see it stop out then you'll see it trigger again in this particular case and then you'll see it hit the initial profit target and then eventually it will stop out, okay? All trades eventually end badly, as I often preach. And that's at 75% rearing its ugly head. In the end, you will give up some of those open profits. And that's when tra that's that's best case. That's, that's what a trade works. Well, Phil says, we always want the pie in the sky. Well, I'm working on it, okay? Hello, Aaron. No worries. John had 20 minutes of detention. Well, whatever you did, John, I hope it was worth it. All right. Let's take a look at this market. And then if you guys want to start opening up uh, for individual stocks, please do that now. Or feel free to do that, I should say. And again, if you don't mind, just type in uh, one symbol per line. 
and so we can uh, so I know which ones I've looked at. All right, let's start off with the peas. Somebody asked me to stop using the word peas for S&P 500 and quack for NASDAQ and rusty for Russell. The, the peas, the story, there's a story behind all these. The, the, the peas, my broker used to always call them the peas back in my early CTA days. And he had a very wealthy um, Middle Eastern client that would like day trade, but use the broke, but day trade without a screen. And uh, my broker was always, I'd be on the phone with him and, and usually nine out of 10 times the other, he'd, he'd be on the other line with the other guy and he'd be taking my orders and I'd hear him go, uh, he'd be like, one sec, Dave. And I get on the peas and he would say peace. And he, he kept quoting the peas and that's where that came from. Anyway, so it has meaning. I'm not just being stupid um, as, as was pointed out to me earlier this week. Before I digress too far, imagine that, huh? Market has generally been, generally been weak as of late. It tried to pop up recently, but then it kind of drifted back down. I think we're in a holding pattern. The only problem is I think everyone is getting a little too comfortable with this holding pattern. And usually traders don't agree for long. So we should see a move out of this fairly quickly because the volatility has dropped down tremendously. We've been in this really tight range. Uh, 50 day HV is down to 13. That's pretty low. Okay. Not just can't go lower. And uh, it's it's kind of interesting. It's I've heard some people say, well, volatility is low, but uh, it's going lower. So we're going to keep selling volatility. Well, that scares the bejesus out of me because that'll work until it don't. But so far, the volatility continues to drop out. Now, ideally, this market would fake out to the downside below this range and make everybody think it's rolling over and then take right back off. Like I said in last week's column, uh, quoting some floors from uh, Linda Rasky, the market will often do the obvious and unobvious way or do whatever it takes and or do whatever it takes to cause the most pain to the most amount of people. So I think the most pain would be for this thing to sell off fairly hard, make everybody think it's coming back at this prior range and then take off shake them out and then take off without them. Uh, but that does concern me a little bit. Obviously there's always something to worry about. That's the other thing too, when it comes to markets. Okay. So that does concern me that if we sell off fairly hard, we would, we could end up back in the sideways soup and that would not be a good thing, especially as a trend follower. So obviously with the market trading mostly sideways over the past couple of months, you want to pick your spots carefully. The good news is, Summer's almost done, at least not on a um, calendar basis, but based on the, the logical summer of Labor Day being the uh, end of summer, the official end of summer. So we're almost done with that. Oh, by the way, how'd that sell in May work out? Ha! I like what uh, Tom McClellan said. He said, just he says, things that, that are a rhyme... Things that rhyme are more likely to be believed. Let's see. We're selling May. Let's see how that worked this year. Oh, it didn't work. Imagine that. Okay. <laughs> Crazy. That's why you got to be careful of those uh, little adages. A client a couple years back, because we, we had a losing summer, emails me. Everyone knows selling May and go away. It's like, well, that's probably mostly true. But if you're going to be a trend follower, you have to chip away at it, even during the summer. You have to keep working at it. And that's the unfortunate thing about markets. You don't know when that next big winner is going to come along. There I go with that streaky thing again, making it sound elusive. But there were a few decent winners this summer that we would have completely missed had we given up. And by the way, without digressing too far, the reason that you you got to be careful with these adages is because you can't trade off of them. And even if they are statistically valid, your representative sample is pretty small. So it could be wrong for several years in a row. And statistically, it's still a valid. It's still valid. So be careful with that kind of stuff. Uh, NASDAQ. Sideways at best there too. As I've said, ad nauseum, I just feel a lot better if we get past this prior peak in here 
and not look back for a while. But it's kind of losing a little steam, trading mostly sideways in here. Take a look at the Russell 2000. One thing that I don't like here is that we just kind of drifted along. And in more recent times, we've kind of gone sideways, which is okay now because it's consolidating. But obviously, if we break below this range, that would be concerning. And what's speed of concerning, as I've been saying quite a bit, I don't like the overhead supply we're dealing with here. I wish it would just get through this, push through it like butter, or cut through it like butter, and keep on going. So I think we're, uh, we could be at an inflection point soon, and things are beginning to unravel just a bit. When we get to the sectors, or let's just hop into the sectors, there's a couple things that are happening. Take a look at retail. We've got a bow tie down in retail. Now, it does have a lot of support below the market. This is why you're not seeing any shorts from me just yet in retail. Take a look at utilities. Same sort of action there, too. Uh, bow tie down. Look at a little iffy end here. Metals and mining have been concerning, too. We get a bow tie down. Specifically, gold and silver becoming a bit of a bummer in here because they're selling off fairly hard. We get into bow tie down. Weekly, on a weekly basis, they still look okay. But on a daily basis, and as you know, the market will turn on a daily before it turns on a weekly. Daily basis, they're beginning to look a little iffy. So you might want to sit in your hands there or at the least make sure you wait for entries. Some areas like the semis kind of hanging in there. Some areas like Internet kind of hanging in there. So it's a bit of a mixed market throughout. But look no further than the S&P 500 and see that we've gone sideways in here as of late. And that's where you want to be super duper selective. Now, not everybody believes this, and, but and you're entitled to your own beliefs. Obviously, it's not my way or highway. But I strongly believe, and I'm quite passionate about things I believe. If you know me, I'm a very passionate person, very passionate person. But I strongly believe that you're not going to beat a market with stocks that are less volatile than the overall market. And some people have other theories. But I would much rather trade something inefficient like that pie than to try to trade some kind of low volatility type of stock. So what I'm getting at is the S&P 500 and big thick stocks tend to be efficient because traders tend to cancel each other out. In order to beat a market, you have to find inefficient stocks, stocks that can make that 20% move in one day as opposed to something like the S&P 500, which makes a what? Uh, a 0.22% move in uh, nearly two months. What's that? Six weeks, okay? So look for inefficiencies. I'll be happy to, Jerry. Just give me one second. In fact, let's go ahead and start looking at some stocks. Um, what else is happening in the sectors? Let's take a look at gold commodity real quick. Gold commodity beginning to roll over a little bit. Again, longer term, it sort of still looks pretty good. It's, it's coming back to this prior breakout, though, losing a little momentum. That's a weekly chart. So on a daily chart, beginning to roll over, look a little iffy. By the way, uh, somebody was asking me about gold and, and, and oil and these, these, these stocks that are related to them. Keep in mind that stocks that are based on an efficient market, such as gold, silver, and energies they can trend at times and they're worth trading but a lot of times it's a very bumpy ride because they're held hostage by the underlying very efficient market okay all right let's uh take a look at some of these uh stock picks in here keep them coming keep them coming <laughs> i just want a piece of the pie half on a move is no good no half on a move is no good well, yeah, take half off and then let some ride because we're playing to win. I mean, take a look at something like, um, now we did get stopped out of this one, so maybe it's not a great example. But this is what playing to win is, okay? This was our original trade back here, and it didn't work out, but let's assume we didn't get stopped out. That's a 200% run. And the reason I'm, one, one reason I'm showing is I know some people were able to uh, hang on to that one. But take a look at like pi. So it might be a little frothy in here right now. 
So we're going to take some partial profits, but hang on to a piece just in case it keeps on going. Long TCMD. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, that's not bad. Uh, this is uh, an IPO type of breakout pattern. It looks a little thin. But, yeah, this is the uh, IPO breakout pattern we talk about quite often. Yeah, that's not a, not a bad looking uh, deal. Can't argue with you. I don't know where you're making an opinion, opinion or a statement. Okay, Phil says, sometimes I get confused with the following. Should we look at the SPX or SPY for all the cash, or should we look at daily futures for swing trading? Well, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, I like to look at the, the cash, the just uh, the regular index itself. If you're looking for like an opening gap reversal or something, then obviously you want to take a look at the spiders and stuff, something like that. Uh, but the cash... I believe the cash is a little bit pure type of index as opposed to a derivative. And obviously you're trading E-minis and you look at E-minis, but I like looking at the cash. And, and don't complicate it. Uh, don't think too much. And that's the secret. Uh, futures futures are a derivative, so you're going to have decay and you're going to have some issues that happen there. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't look at the futures or worry about the futures unless you're actually trading them. I wouldn't look at the spies and worry about the spies Unless you're trying to catch like an opening gap reversal or something. Okay. Getting a couple questions about, actually two questions on ARG from a couple of you guys. That's going to be a, a recent IPO. No, it's not a TKO. Uh, it does have a breakout. It did have a breakout pattern recently in it. Uh, but it's not a TKO yet, yet, but it is on my list. So on a pullback, uh, I think it could be worthwhile. PVG for those who use discretion to hold. Yeah, uh, PVG was in my um, service, and it just kind of, it kind of came down and and kind of went back and went down and just kind of nicked that stop or a little bit more than nicked it, but um, and then it sort of bottomed out. Well. If you're still long, stay long because longer term, it's still in a pretty good uptrend in here. If you took it, that's you want to pop out to the weekly and justify your positions. But on a weekly basis, so far, it's just kind of pulled back. It has a double top knockout look to it. But do honor your stop, and it really shouldn't take out the bottom of these uh, these lows in here. It shouldn't really go below nine. So if you're still in this one, this was a loser recommended. Hey, guess what? Occasionally, we do have a loser. Okay. Dave, stop talking about how bad things can go and just talk about the good stuff. I can't. This is all reality, you know? Take the good with the bad, or the bad with the good. We want to look at that. But, yeah, have a stop in place on that, uh, Angelo. Uh, we do have a bow tie down, so it does not look good. But I like to try to let the market make decisions for me. So at this juncture, just honor your stop. OK, because it doesn't look it doesn't look great. Looks like it's beginning to deteriorate a little bit. <laughs> Dave Landry is not a loser. Thank you, Angelo. Mew from for Jim. Mew. Uh, Mew is a big, thick stock. OK, but it can trend at times. Uh, it still has a little bit of overhead supply to overcome. I think I would pass on this one. You had this big gap down. Uh, markets have long memories. So I think I'd try to find something else with a little clearer air. At this juncture, I, I still, I'm still i still a big um, fan of the IPOs. And you got to be patient there. Brew? Oh, I would love to brew. I need a brew. Um, it looks kind of interesting. The, the, it's made a pretty substantial move so far. It's a little on the thin side, too, 160000 on average. But as a private trader, you can certainly take it. Uh, I think it's made a little bit too much of an extreme move, given the nature of their business especially, okay? It's considered a food and beverage not that, the, not that you can't get excitement in a, in a food and beverage, but 
you certainly could do a lot worse. As I said, I kind of set myself up for, for possible failure uh, with, with people asking about stocks that simply aren't trending at all. This is a stock that's obviously trending. It's obviously accelerating higher. But it's going it, – it may have gone a little too far too fast, 100% move over a short period of time. Look at your HV. It's closing in on 100. It's almost to 100, triple-digit HV. So a little bit on the thin side. So I, I think it's a little too dangerous even for my standards to go after, but I certainly can't argue with it. But maybe on a little bit more of a knockout move, a little bit more pullback in other words because it's had such a sharp run higher. But I think I would, I would pass on that one. pick for Mr. Jerry. Uh, yeah, this looks pretty good. Maybe on a pullback. You know, problem is if it pulls back too much, you're kind of back below this prior uh, peak in here. But the run has been so significant for lows. So yeah, maybe on a pullback. Certainly keep it on your watch list. I have all these IPOs on my watch list for what it's worth. W Y N N for Mr. T. It's going to be a, a casino, right? All right. Now, are you looking to go long or are you looking to go sh short? Because if anything, this looks like a short. Now, this might be uh, – maybe I spoke too soon. This might be our electrocardiogram um, example of the week, okay? It's down. It's uh, It's a Jackie Mason stock. It's up. It's down. It's up. It's down. Um. Yeah, I don't see anything here worth worth doing because net net it hasn't done anything in a long, long time in six months. I mean, if anything, it looks like it could be a trouble today, notwithstanding. But I would leave it alone. John wants to know about ESNT. ESNT. This looks pretty good. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Um, I'm not a huge fan of stocks when they're when they're in longer term trends going back up to their prior peaks like this. I prefer them to be in clear air. But it looks okay. Um, I can kind of pick it apart a little bit though, because it's kind of pulled back to this prior little basin here. It looks okay. I I personally wouldn't take it, but I think it looks it looks okay. But for those aforementioned reasons, I think I'd pass. TWLO, that's one on my watch list. Um, it's gotten a little crazy, even by my standards, right? Uh, it's not bad, though. I tell you, know, see, you guys are making my job harder because usually I get a lot of questions about electric choreograms, and my job's pretty easy here. I'm just saying, oh, are you kidding me? But you're asking about a lot of good stocks today. Quite a few days of the pullbacks. A little bit more leading with IPOs. Uh, I would give this one. Uh, I would say yes to this one, but only for the super aggressive traders because it looks like it's it's a it's kind of crazy in here. Uh, but here's the deal: it's going to require an incredibly wide berth. I would say maybe an entry entry above this pivot high, and then you're going to have to have a stop way down here somewhere. So. Uh, we don't have enough days for HV, but we will soon. But I can tell you just by eyeballing it, the HV is borderline uh, crazy on that one. KLDX. KLDX. Yeah, this looks pretty interesting. Um, one concern is that it is a metals and mining stock. And what's going on with the metals and mining? Eh, it's starting to look a little iffy in here. Okay. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, the overall market, eh, it's, it's tough to, to use the overall market to help you time things with commodity related stocks because commodities can trade independently of the overall market, obviously. Um, maybe on a pullback, it's had a pretty good run in here, maybe on a pullback. Okay. But I would weigh that against the fact that the metals aren't doing so hot lately. And it would really have to knock my socks off for me to take a new position in the metals at this juncture. But that's where you have to be careful not to micromanage. He's like, well, Dave, don't you have some metals in the portfolio? Yeah, let them go. Let's just see what happens. Okay. Exiting would be a playing not to lose strategy. 
which over the short term makes a heck of a lot of sense. But longer term, you're not going to win by quitting. Ooh, write that down. Sounds pretty good. D-R-U-A. Uh, looks pretty, pretty thin. Uh, let's see. Well, here's the thing. Uh, you can watch your scaling on this one because you're like, ooh, that looks fantastic. I just took off in here. Well, it's 25 here. It's 25.70. That's a 70 cent move over like a month or two. Okay. So the range is too, is too small on this for me to get excited. Now, what you could do is you could certainly watch it and see if it does make a significant move, then play a pullback. But I wouldn't play a breakout type of strategy on something like that. By the way, for those who are new to my methodology, in general, I don't play breakouts except with the, with the minor exception of occasionally in an IPO, there is some uh, breakout characteristics that I'm willing to trade. T-Pick, did we talk about that one already? That sounds familiar. T-Pick, I think we did. Let's T-P-I-C. Yeah, we talked about that one. Okay. Stop at 950 on that one. Yeah, 9 or 950. Uh, I think no, I would have to stop on 9 on that PVG. Look at the scale on Dominion, only 70 cents. Yeah, I just said that, Phil. Uh, perfect. Donald's saying light. Yeah, Phil's. I need to hire Phil. Phil's a. Uh, Phil knows his stuff. And that's where I'm flattered is like when I, I, I have a lot of clients I'm humbled by that are really good at what they do and they know what they're doing. And it's kind of cool. And then I have others I have to constantly beat over the head. But that's good too. It makes for good learning examples. <laughs> Who is this? I saw a while back somebody had a, um, there's a ship sinking, you know, and it says uh, maybe the reason, maybe the reason you're here is to help other people to avoid making mistakes or something like that. I, I, I need to find that. Um, <laughs> it's one of those demotivational posters that I just thought it was hilarious. So, so I guess we need people making a lot of mistakes to help us help remind us not to make mistakes. Uh, this looks pretty good. It's obviously trending, but uh, it needs a pullback. So yeah, this should be on your watch list and it is on mine. I still have scars in my head from your two by fours. Cause it hit you over the head. <laughs> Hit you over the head like a two by four. I N V N for Jim. I N V N. Uh, on a pullback, eh? It's not jumping out at me. And I guess it, it still has this uh, overhead supply to overcome. And then it's going to have some issues all the way up. Uh, I hear you though. I mean, it's bottomed out. It's trying to make its way higher. But look how many days in the pullback. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A bunch more than I count quickly. Uh, I think I'd pass based on that reasoning. But I see what you're seeing. It, it looks like it's bottomed out, but I would um, pass. Oh, you're saying it's a bow tie? Let's take a look at that. Yeah, the bow tie was back here, and then I guess the trigger would have been somewhere in here. But even back here, I didn't like it because of this overhead supply. WB on a pullback or a TKO for arsony. WB. Yeah, yeah, why not? Uh, it's in the right sector. Uh, take a look at Internet. Internet is winning for the most part. Longer term uptrend attack there. And, uh, I mean, you guys are getting better and better. I'm, I might have to just drop the mic, walk off stage. You guys got it. Um, yeah, I'd like to see some knockout move. I mean, I guess one of my concerns is that it's in a pretty extended longer term uptrend. But Dave is a trend follower. It's never too high to buy. Yeah. But I'm just kind of wondering, or one thing that makes me a little nervous that's in the back of my head. And again, there's always something to worry about, as I often say. But one thing to consider is that if the market does start to forge ahead and continue higher, and this is something that could be a little perverse and kind of hard to wrap your head around, but sometimes the stronger relative strength stocks can end up being a source of funds, but I can't argue with it because it looks darn good. So yeah, if it makes a nice little knockout move, it might be worth a shot. Uh, it has accelerated higher. It's had a little drift in here as of late, but it, but as a general statement, it's was working its way higher. That accelerated higher. So yeah, a knockout move, but it's going to have to be a pretty serious knockout move there. T 
TWL we talked about already. And I'll get this recording up as soon as possible. Usually it takes at least two hours. I've got a lot going on this afternoon, so it might not go up till tonight. Um, no, wait for new highs on this one. It just kind of barely got past this high here, and then it barely got past this high here. So wait for wait for something that looks like this, and then maybe look to play a pullback afterwards on that one. Nothing wrong with having that on your watch list, though. It doesn't cost anything, right? C S T M. Uh, no, because your your big move higher is only a couple days, and it's uh, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, maybe if it follows through on a pullback. It's also in uh, aluminium, which is one of the metals, which is doing great. It's not bad. But let's see what happens with a pullback. Whack. You want to buy this? No. Well, you got this big gap down over here. Uh, it's kind of bumping along. I hear what you're saying. It kind of bottomed out in here. Um, HV is 100. That's a little crazy. What are the REITs doing right now? REITs aren't doing too well, right? Okay, let's take a look at the REITs. Uh, REITs, you got a bow tie down or close to a bow tie down. Look at a little questionable. So I don't know. I wouldn't, I don't think I'd go after a wheat or a REIT to this point. A wheat? CRBV. Uh, I don't have that on my computer. CRBV. Maybe you got a uh, fat finger to symbol when you got them transposed. What did you think about TWLO? Well, you'll have to watch the recording to see. Such a tease. Uh, yeah, I just don't want to spend too much time going over things I already went over. Just just for the sake of everyone else here, I'm not being mean to you. Um, this would actually have to make new highs decisively and then pull back again. Uh, put it on your list as a momentum stock. Absolutely, Art. NTLA, too long in a pullback. All right, let's take a look at that NTLA. Um... Well, it's bottomed out. Not so much too long in the pullback, but it's pulled back to its prior little base in here. So let it bottom out again and see if it could take off. As a relatively new issue, it might still have potential. I think we traded this one maybe back here. I think that stopped out. All trades eventually end badly, though. That's a thing you got to remember. Kato's for KLH. I think that's Karen. Hello, Karen. How are things in New York? Yeah, this one looks okay. I'm not crazy about the little gap in here, but this has been in my um, in my watch list for quite a while. The move up higher is pretty extreme. Uh, I think the reason I haven't put it on as a recommendation. Even though it's a long time ago, it just has a lot of overhead supply. Sometimes markets have long memories, and that's why I haven't used it as an official setup. Uh, but it has been showing up in my um, in my watch list, and I think I've been showing it in a service, GCM, GCP. GCP. Yeah, it looks kind of interesting. Um, I'd almost like to see it accelerate higher a little bit because it really hasn't gotten past its prior peak. But one thing I do like is I do like the fact that it's very persistent in its trend. So if it can continue higher, next pullback, absolutely. Thanks, it's Karen. All right. Dave, COTV, who's that for T – how's that for TKO? Uh, on A22, would you add more shares and resumption of trend if you're already in? It sounds like he's already in. All right, Jerry, let's see what you got. Yeah, the only thing I didn't like about this TKO was that – I like a TKO to not make a new high on the day it does a TKO, but I guess there's, I guess there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. I guess I you know, um, I can't really pick that apart too much. Okay. Uh, no, I wouldn't add on to this trade if you're already long because you haven't, unless you've already hit your profit target. But even if you have already hit your profit target, it would have to set up again before you add back in. Never add to an existing position unless you've already sold out half at the profit target and it's set up again. So like, like pie, for instance, a couple of you guys email me on that and you use a little discretion down here and you stayed with the position. 
So yeah, you would add back in. And I think Jerry, you're in here. You added back in right around here. We talked about this. Well, what's cool about Jerry used to ask me a lot of questions and now he like asks me a question and then answers it. <laughs> My reply is easy. I'm like, yeah, Jerry, what you answered your own question. <laughs> He's becoming the perfect client. Um, but yeah, Jerry, you, uh, Jerry ad did an add on on this one. So, you know, you got it here and then it took off and then it set up again. So only do your add ons after you flip out A and then B once they're set up again. Write that down. Okay. Uh, Susie wants to look at reader, R E T A, R E T A. Uh, it's biotechnology. Ooh, is that uh, a little on the thin side? Is that right? Um, I don't see anything to do with this one just yet. Let it maybe break out to new highs. Not necessarily all-time highs. It's still a relatively new issue. But let's see if it could push up maybe towards 24 or so and then pull back and then uh, reevaluate it there. You're welcome, Jerry. I need a... Uh... <laughs> Now, I do beat my clients up too. I don't just, uh, I'm, I'm not just sugary with them. I beat them up sometimes. Yeah, we talked about this one already. CSTM, MEDP. Uh, nothing to do there yet. Uh, fairly narrow range, okay? Yeah. Remember what the IPOs, as I said in the course, what's the story, fad or glory? And if it is a fad or a glory type of stock, then it should at least be able to have some range. So, uh, of course, you want to you want something exciting to be happening with the company. In fact, the company's not exciting. Why would they even bother to take it to public? This is my question in the first place. Um, but the range is too small, so. Do not implement a breakout strategy, or I should say I would not implement a breakout strategy on this one, but rather let it break out, see if it can follow through, and then look to get in. You're welcome. Uh, Susie. Uh, Eric says, based on PBG and PI the last few days, would you advise never to hold a sell order overnight? We have the luxury of watching the open. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you have the luxury of watching the open – then by all means. Or the other thing you could do is you could put it in a contingency order, and that opens up a box of a box of worms, a can of worms. That opens up a can of worms because every broker is going to have a different contingency order system. So get familiar with your broker's contingency order system. You're on your own there uh, because I have no inclination to go in and help you figure out an algorithm. Uh, I'm sorry to help you program the algorithm or figure out what what. I could help you figure out what needs to go in, but the actual execution is up to you, obviously. Um, and the reason is because every broker is going to have a different contingency thing, and every broker within their platform is going to have a different contingency thing. So I want to stay away from that type of um, support. But if you could say a contingency thing like, okay, it has to be uh, asking uh, above a certain level. I'm sorry, it has to be bidding above a certain level. And it actually has to, you could uh, put in some parameters there and make sure it's just not like a low volume bid or something. So if you don't have the luxury of watching the open, maybe noodle around a little bit with that contingency order system that most brokerages have nowadays to see if there's something you could put in there to to um, sort of watch that open, so to speak, without you actually having to watch the open. OCLR and a TKO. OCLR. Uh, yeah, on a TKO, sure, absolutely. You know, put that on your momentum watch list. That's a pretty serious trend there. But, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely, a TKO, something, sure. LN for Donald. Got a few Donalds in here today. Yeah, this looks okay. Uh, quite a few days of the pullback, but it is still an IPO. It looks okay. You know, maybe 45 or so and stop around 40-ish or so. You could certainly do much worse. I mean, it's not jumping out at me as the greatest setup in setup town, but I certainly can't argue with it. And it is an IPO, uh, and so that has some additional excitement. So, yeah, that's that's not bad. I think the more I look at it, the more I might like it. 
Jerry says, COTV. Yeah, we talked about that one. Uh, NGVT. NGVT. Uh, well, it's sideways at best lately. So, you know the routine. It would have to break out and then pull back. Break out well above this little sideways base. If you're long, stay long. AMBA for the other Don, AMBA. We got like three Dons in here today, AMBA. Uh, yeah, this looks good, but on a bit of a knockout move. It's got some issues longer term, but over the short term, it looks pretty darn good. So I think that the, um, not to make a uh, pun because Donald's asking, but I think the shorter term action trumps the longer term action. Um, yeah, on a pullback. LN is a reissue, isn't it? There's a gap below also. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the problem is with LN. LN. It's a reissue. It's not a real, it's not a new stock. Yeah, I mean, that's, see, that's where it's such a complicated world. It's showing up in my system as, a, as an IPO, but it's, it's, it's not a, um, it's, it's a reissue, okay, according to what Karen is saying. So sometimes it doesn't hurt to double check uh, with a second quote feed. I have a stockcharts.com account that I use for that usually. Sometimes I just go to Yahoo um, for, for stuff. Did we talk about this one? Yeah, range is not big enough on that one, Howard. So let it uh, open up a little bit. Uh, NH, we talked about that one. That's going to be like some uh, medical company or something. Diagnostics. National Health. Nano Health. Um. Yeah, it looks all right as far as like uh, sometimes these IPOs are okay, but they come down, bottom out, and then take off again. They they this is one of the anomalies I've talked about quite a bit is that they come out and they're priced too high and they die, but then they they bottom out and get their act together. Um, but yeah, it looks okay. I mean, you would you would have gotten a trigger already in it, but I still think it has potential. So I keep an eye on that one, sure. The company was formerly known as NHN, Japan Corporation, and changed its name to Outline Corporation. The company was incorporated in 2000, based in Tokyo. Yeah. Um, Finviz. Okay. Finviz. That's a good That's a good site for those type of things. I don't use it, but I know a lot of my clients do or have. AMBA. We talked about this one. Yeah, on a pullback. Absolutely. Good, uh, good eye, Don. TLND still holding out their pullback entry made last week. Thoughts? All right, let's take a look at that. TLND. Uh, no. Um, you know, have yourself has have yourself a place to stop out because as a new issue or as an IPO, if it drops below this this uh, Oh, especially this opening range and all, then then everybody's a hurt and pup unless they sold out quickly over here. But if somebody's hands are tied to where they can't sell right away, that's a pent-up supply, potential supply in the market. Um, and then just from a technical standpoint, it shouldn't make new lows. So have a stop in mind on that one. CRM. Uh, you look at a short this one, maybe on a, maybe on a bit of a bounce. Uh, it is coming off. It's kind of wide and loose longer term. So I'd be nervous about that, but I hear you on a bounce. It looks like it's in a lot of trouble. So if anything, it's possible short. You're not looking to buy that. Are you? If you are, uh, you're my example of the week of what not to do. I don't think you are. Or you wouldn't admit it to me. Uh, this one's kind of thin. It's a relatively new issue. Uh, I think I'd leave it alone because it's thin, and it just has a couple of wide range bars. That's 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 trend just made of a couple of big bars up. I think it's too thin. No, you want to go long or short, Don? F S A M. We talked about that one. All right, W B. Don't want knockout as I am long from 29. Oh. So feels long from 29. Well, good job on that one.
Sup, V. Oh, sup, V. Thought you were being slang with me. I'm like, sup, V. Uh, volume's a little low, but it is an IPO, so you could be a little bit more lenient with the volume. Uh, not sure what's going on with this wide range bar and all back here. I guess at this point in time, I would let it break out. Range is pretty tight. So let it break out, see if it can keep on going, and then look, didn't look to play pullbacks along the way. Uh, it's a foreign stock, so you might want to check to make sure it doesn't trade in a foreign land. And then if that if that's the case, then you lose some of the um, – or all of the IPO potential. Alta is a short. It's possible. Um it's got a big gap up here. Uh, I wouldn't rush out and short it, but I hear you. It does look like it's a stock that's in trouble. I'm not really looking for – no, I'm always looking for shorts. But I'm not really looking to short as a general statement just yet um, in, unless and until things begin to deteriorate a little bit more. But, yeah, it's not bad as a possible short. Could be in trouble. GDX, 618 per retracement, prior swing, not your style, go along here. Uh, I hear you. Yeah, it's not my style. I'm not a um, big retrace guy, but to each his own. And, and um, I know a lot of people trade retraces and things. Uh, Larry, if he's still in here, he's a retrace guy. It's just we all develop our different uh, likes and tastes in markets. Let's take a look at that. Uh, I guess you're looking at... What are you looking at for the retrace? Let's see. Yeah, I don't know what you're measuring 618 off of, but take a look at the weekly chart. Uh, and I hear you. I mean, it still looks okay on a weekly chart. But, yeah, it's it, it's not my style, as you said. But, you know, it's, it's not my way of the highway, as I often preach. But whatever you do, just do it well. And know what you're doing, okay? And spend your spend the, the greater part of your life doing that. ATMR. Um, my only concern is you just have this one bar up here, and then it is it does look pretty thin. It's a new issue, I hear you, but I think I would let this one shake out. It's, it look for a secondary type of pattern. We have uh, pioneer patterns where we look to get in as early as possible. And then we have secondary patterns where it's a little bit closer to the core methodology. Where we're waiting for the established trend or the trend to establish, I should say, and then look to play pullbacks along the way. So I think I'd wait on that one, Donald. All right. Okay, any more? We're nearly out of time. I guess while we're at the impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. As I say each week, I'm humbled by your appearance. Okay, any any more? we got time for one or two more. All right. Well, look, long holiday weekend ahead. Everybody enjoy yourself. Uh, be be safe. Have fun. If we don't talk between now and then, any, un un any unanswered questions, feel free to shoot me an email, and then I'll try to get the recording up within a couple of hours. So uh, keep an eye out for that for those of you who missed some earlier stocks. Uh, and, again, everybody have a great uh, Labor Day, and uh, we'll talk again, I guess, uh, next Thursday. I hope to see all you guys and girls uh, back then. Thank you so much.